Excellencies and Ambassadors, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good afternoon. I'm Fatima Binti Zahid, currently working as a research assistant at Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies, BIPS. Today, I welcome you to the BIPS Roundtable on Two Years of Military Rule in Myanmar, Ramifications for the Future. The moderator for today's roundtable is Major General Munru Zaman, NDC PSC, President of BIPS. Our speakers for today are Brigadier General Shakhawat Hussein, PhD, Senior Fellow at South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance, North South University, Brigadier General Shahidul Anam Khan, NDC, PSC, former Associate Editor, The Daily Star, and Parvis Karim Abbasi, Assistant Professor, East West University. Now, I would like to invite the moderator to carry on the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to our monthly roundtable on a key strategic issue. And this month, we have chosen the topic of the two years of military rule in Myanmar and the ramifications for the future. Since 1st February 2021, when Takmado or the Myanmar military took over the reins of power in Myanmar, the country has really gone through a very difficult patch of history. As we look back at the last two years, over 3,000 people have been killed. 3,000 Myanmar citizens were killed in different kinds of military operations. Over 16,000 people are still being currently detained in that country. And over 4,500 Myanmar citizens have been sentenced to different periods of prison terms by the military. What is currently happening in Myanmar is not confined to the Myanmar territory but it has ramifications beyond the Myanmar territory. So as we look back, we see there are domestic compulsions and ramifications, there are severe regional implications, and there are obviously a number of international implications of the current Myanmar military rule in that country. We are all aware of the current Rohingya refugee crisis and the military rule in Myanmar have deep multiple consequences to the solution of the Rohingya refugee crisis who are being housed in Bangladesh for the last couple of years. The People's Defense Force have been waging a very powerful struggle to unseat the Myanmar military regime, but without a success. We also see a number of insurgent or dissident groups operating in various parts of Myanmar, notably at least nine groups are operating with a considerable amount of military power. Of critical interest to Bangladesh is the Arakan army that operates in the Rakhine province close to Bangladesh. And the Arakan army is gaining strength day by day. In many cases, they operate freely within the Rakhine province. And the implications of the Arakan army's operations in Rakhine has deep consequences for Bangladesh. Adding to the whole issues that are under discussion is the new Burma Act, which has been now enacted by the US Congress. And having read the Burma Act very carefully, it not only talks about Myanmar, it talks about establishment of democracy and rights of ethnic groups within the surrounding countries of Myanmar. And it names two countries along with Myanmar, which is Bangladesh and Thailand. So going between the lines of the Burma Act, it gives us a feeling that the Burma Act has very deep consequences even for Bangladesh. And we need to understand that very carefully. So to really 
decipher a very complex scenario, we have assembled a group of experts who can really throw light on the issues. And as has been mentioned to you, there are three prominent analysts and experts who will talk to us today. One of our speaker is still stuck in the classical Dhaka traffic, but he'll be joining us soon. So we'll start with Pervez Karim Abbasi from East West University. Pervez, you have the floor for the next 10 minutes. A very good afternoon and thank you, sir, for acknowledging civilian supremacy. So again, I probably, I'm the only one who's 100% civilian within this category. <laughs> <laughs> probably a sign of things to come. Uh, first of all, because we are running a time constraint, I'll be straight to the point. Let me give you a tentative outline of the presentation, plus minus one or two topics. First of all is, again, number one, what is the current status of the Myanmar's economy as of now? Number two, what is keeping the Myanmar's economy afloat? And we'll find out that there are several avenues. Number three, a host of sanctions has been imposed on Myanmar, but despite this, the Myanmar's economy keeps swimming. So why is it not, why are the sanctions not effective? So what are the lacunas or again, the gaps through which the sanctions are being evaded or being avoided? The fourth impact is the emerging nuclear issue whereby Myanmar is pursuing to acquire nuclear power or again, civilian nuclear power and we look into this. Is this a cause for alarm or is this undue hype? Last but not the least, we'll be looking into, again, cursorily, the Burma Act. And again, how does it touch Bangladesh? So this is an ambitious undertaking. So let me start off. First of all, the Myanmar's economy has basically gone from bad to worse. It actually makes Bangladesh's economy look like a shining case. I know this is a very poor example. But uh, again, let me just reinforce what has happened to the economy. Number one. The economy has to bear the bunt, brunt of the coup, the ravages of COVID-19, uh, post-COVID armed insurgency, and again, conflict, and also a host of sanctions. There's a shortage of US dollars. There's a depreciation of the kiat, the local Myanmar's currency. Number three, cash shortages in banks and cash restriction in terms of daily usage and withdrawal from the ATMs and also rise in fuel and commodity prices. At least 1.1 million people are not in employment as of 2022 compared to last year. And this is according to ILO estimates. 40% people are living below the poverty line. And it's heartbreaking that 15.2 million people are facing food security crisis. 5 million children are in need of humanitarian assistance, 7.5 million people, school ch children are out of school, and 1.1 million people are displaced in Saigang, Sagaing, and Magwe regions. This is the bare facts. So it's not a pretty picture. And at least 70% of the population in Myanmar are directly engaged in agricultural activity, and the lion's share is to be found within the heartland region of Myanmar, the Bamar heartland, and agriculture activities have been severely disrupted. At least 3.7 million resident Myanmaris have left the country since the beginning of the coup and the coup-related uh, chaos, and most of them are settled in Thailand. Even So this is a sorry picture, and we don't wish any country to go through this, even a neighboring country with whom we have strained relations. But the Myanmar's economy keeps on ticking. It does not simply fold. What is the reason behind this? Well, one reason is remittance. Because at least 4% officially, and at least unofficially, 12% of remittance uh, of a basically constitutes, or remittance constitutes around 12% unofficially of the GDP of Myanmar. Most of this comes from Thailand. Because you have a huge Myanmar's expat population over there. In fact, the second largest buyers of housing apartments among foreign residents in Thailand after the Chinese are the Myanmaris. 
So that is Thailand has become a base of operations for both the pro-government and anti-government people over there. Now, if you look amongst this, then you would think that they, again, the, even the Tatmadaw controlled government is doing all it is, can to basically look out for its people. You'd be shocked to know that allocation for health, allocation for education, allocation for social security services have been scaled back significantly. Whereas budget allocation for defense has been ramped up from 10% to 12% in one year, which has significant security implications for its neighboring countries, including Bangladesh. Now, what is propping up Myanmar's economy? Amongst all of this, and this is World Bank data, Myanmar's economy is supposed to grow from 2% to 3.3% in 2023. So it defies economic logic. So what's happening over here? And there is the rub. Because over here, the Myanmar Statmadao are now relying on resource extractive industries, which was previously put on hold during On Suu Kyi's government. And over here, the prime investors in Myanmar is Singapore, Hong Kong, and China. In fact, Singapore and China makes up 50% of uh, Singapore's, uh, so Myanmar's trade volume. Singapore is the largest investor in Myanmar. And ASEAN countries have provided a cocoon through which basically the blunt of sanctions has been quite uh, uh, significantly reduced. And along with this, you have China and India. Now, over there, Mining in Rakhine and Karen states and Kachin state is continuing unabated. And again, the companies that are there are usually Thai or South Korean companies, which are exploring over there. Natural gas exploration brings Myanmar around $1 billion. Apart from this, amidst all this turmoil, you would think that there's a need for austerity. But you would be surprised to know that in one year's time, Minong Lai's government has distributed around $33 million, inter, which is 7 billion kiats, in terms of monetary honor disbursements. 3,600 individuals have been... Three thousand six hundred individuals have been basically awarded uh, monetary recognition. So if an economy is doing poorly, how is this money coming from? Because the Tatmadaw exercises significant control over the resources and the economy. And this is where the sanctions come into play. Has the sanctions made a dent in Myanmar? Well, now, for example, and this is the part where the ASEAN involvement is significant, and I'll just mention one. There is a, something called the Golden City Multi-Level uh, multi de Development Project, and this it has been started off by a Singaporean company. And over here, the Chinese and Thai companies basically have invested over there. Now, the problem of this is that around 49% of it is owned by a Singaporean company. It is called ETC, Emerging Tower and Cities Company. And the payment over there is directly made to the Quartermaster General's account in Myanmar. And that money is widely suspected is used to buy arms, equipment, so on and so forth. But again, ASEAN countries are investing and propping up the Myanmar's regime. We hear a lot about China and Russia, but again, the dynamics are with the ASEAN economy. And then again, they have their own reason and their own logic in terms of non-interference and quiet diplomacy. So that angle needs to be explored later. Now we come to the fact is, are sanctions effective? Now, according to Peterson uh, Institute of uh, Economics, sanctions, partial or complete, have an effectiveness at best of 33%. At worst, only 5%. A very detailed report. And over here, it must be acknowledged that the West, such as the United States, the United Kingdom, European Union, Australia, have been quite vocal in terms of basically protesting against the Rohingya genocide and against the military takeover, and a host or slew of sanctions have been imposed. But this is the problem where we have. In recent times, there has been even sanctions on aviation fuel, recent sanctions. Why? Because again, aviation fuel can be used 
for aerial bombing campaigns against civilian population. And again, Myanmar Economic Holding, Myanmar, uh, uh, Myanmar Economic Properties Limited, all Tatmadaw uh, ownerships or, or Tatmadaw business ownerships, they have been sanctioned. But there is a problem. There is asset freeze, there's travel ban, there's embargo on arms and equipments, all of them are there. But then again, where are the funding com is coming for this tottering regime? And now I come completely to the problem of the sanctions. According to Earth Institute, if I remember correctly, again, most of the sanctions are unilateral. Over 60% of the sanctions imposed by the US, the UK, and EU are unilateral. That means there is no coordination. So one sanction of one country or one bloc not, not necessarily covers the areas that has been exempted by other countries. So there are loopholes. And 11, for example, the US and the EU have basically gone about sanctioning almost all the junta members or military junta members of the state administration council. But the UK sanctions have only targeted only 11 people. So you see there is a bit of a lag and in the lack of coordination in terms of the sanctions. And there's also lack of clarity regarding which representative of the state administrative council are you going to deal with? If you deal with representatives affiliated with the SEC council members, will you yourself face sanctions or not? And this is where the Southeast Asian countries or Chinese or Indian companies or Japanese companies are cashing in on. There is also marked less enthusiasm about targeting arms network, because that would have been the normal area of focus. And by, if you look into the independent reports, which has been conducted by the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar, which has recently come out, 13 companies across Europe, Asia, North America, have been accused of assisting Myanmar's military buildup, despite the sanctions. And along with this, in the rogues honors list, you have companies in Austria, France, China, Singapore, India, Israel, Ukraine, Germany, Taiwan, Japan, Russia, South Korea, and even the USA. Let me just cite two or three examples. Again, from the report, none of them have been fabricated. Now, what is the problem over here? The raw materials, the technology, these are being supplied to the DDI, the Directorate of Defense Industries of Myanmar. On the list is the Austrian company GFM Steyr. Now, they have been accused of supplying computer numerical control technology for basically manufacturing gun barrels. When BBC tried to contact them, they did not disclose or they did not respond. Dassault Systems of France, very well known. They have supplied 3D electromagnetic simulation and computer-aided design, CAD, for 3D simulation. And 3D simulation is also used for military strikes. Last but not the least, Germany-based Siemens Digital has also provided multiple software technology. And for all those bleeding hearts for Ukraine, even Ukraine's Ukrex export, Ukrex export, I'm sorry if I can't get the pronunciation right, has provided transfer technology for self-propelled howitzers, armored personnel carrier, and light tanks. So everybody has a finger in the pie. Even Israel has been accused of transferring technology. There were talks about Pakistan. There were talks about India. So again, the arms network, until and unless you manage to quash it, the Tatmada will continue acting against the insurgents, and the sanctions will not be effective. Last but not the least, there are only two segments of the uh, outline left. One is the nuclear ang angle. In re it has been, it has, there is always a lot of speculation that Myanmar was trying to acquire nuclear technology, but for peaceful civilian uses. In recent times, the Myanmar's uh, state ministry for electric generation, that means Ministry of Electric Power, and Rosatom has signed an MOU for carrying out joint feasibility study. What is the need for this? Because the need for this is they are going to acquire small modular reactors supplied by Rosatom. It must be admitted as per scientific research that the R Russia is way ahead of the United States and UK in terms of building small modular nuclear reactors. This is for civilian usage. 
Now, if this is the case, what's wrong with this? Because nuclear, because nu and they're saying that again, the gas fields are being depleted. So, and again, there's rolling power blackouts in Myanmar. So in the next four to five years, they want to acquire nuclear energy for uh, civilian uh, usage. But there are some problems over there. Because though nuclear, uh, though Myanmar has signed basically the CTBT treaty, and it's also a part of the, uh, the Bangkok Treaty, or Treaty of Bangkok, within which is basically an agreement among ASEAN countries, whereby there will be no nuclear proliferation or building of nuclear weapons. But they've also added a small caveat or protocol with IEA, which is the watchdog energy uh, agency for uh, nuclear proliferation. And what is that? That is basically a small quantity protocol. That means it, that they can acquire certain portions of nuclear supply without IEA inspection, provided it doesn't concern, uh, provided it doesn't basically cover a certain degree of threshold. And in 2007, they have also acquired or they've restored relationships with North Korea. And with North Korea, we hear allegations of proliferation of nuclear technology. I've been given this one minute late reminder, so I'll just sum it up. Last but not the least, you have the recently drafted and agreed to upon Burma Act. Again, it's a step in the right direction whereby the US government strongly focuses on basically supporting the national unity government and the ethnic armed organizations which are fighting and also cracking down on the military tentacles of the Tatmadaw. But section 301, and which is where General Munir had referred to, when they're saying that they're going to empower and encourage CSOs and human rights organizations in Bangladesh and Thailand and in neighboring regions to basically foster the return of democracy in Myanmar, that puts us in the crosshairs. Because why would you mention Bangladesh and Thailand as neighboring countries and leave out India? Will that basically incite greater animosity between Myanmar and Bangladesh? This is just a question because it requires further clarification. And if during the Q&A time I have time, I'd like to focus on certain activities of NUG, which or the national unity government, which is not necessarily conducive to Rohingya repatriation. Thank you. Oh. Pervez, thank you very much for giving us a detailed account of the current Myanmar economy in particular the impact of the sanctions that has been imposed on Myanmar. A country which is basically food sufficient and energy sufficient, it is very difficult to crack that country with sanctions. Also a country which has lived under sanctions for decades, years and decades, with very little international contact, has got a robust mechanism internally how to cope with sanctions. Just as an anecdote, I would like to mention that BIPS together with the government of Bangladesh was involved in the process of a track to dialogue with Myanmar prior to the military government's taking over power. We did that for over three years. As a part of that dialogue, I also led a delegation to Myanmar and had extensive interactions and I came back with the feeling that their internal mechanisms is so robust that they are able to live in isolation for decades. It doesn't really affect them. In addition to that, they have a thriving gem business, which is in the black market. They have a very thriving drug business, which is again in the black market and offers drugs to many countries in the region. So the economy sustains itself. So those are the issues that will again come into discussion. But I would now like to give the floor to our next speaker, Brigadier General Sakhawat. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much, <clears throat> General Munid. Thank you, Bips, for inviting me and uh, giving me a bit of a time to discuss a certain very important issue that we are facing as a nation. It's not only we facing. Uh, being faced by the regional countries. I would say, I think uh, uh, Pervez has very discussed in detail and he has made my uh, discussion easier than what I could think of. And then of course, uh, 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 Brigadier Anam, who would then deliver 
probably what I would left out with. First of all, why are we discussing Myanmar? Why didn't we discuss it uh, last, let's say, 30, 35, 40 years? Why we are discussing now almost every day? My university where I work, NSU North South University, we already had five discussions on this. Last was uh, a few days back when we had the NUG government representative as the minister. And then we also had along with him the foreign ministry of NUG in exile. As you know, the foreign ministry of NUG has just opened up their office in Washington, D.C. And we, what we did, because I wanted to start where Pervez had uh, stopped by saying NUG, we got the, uh, very clear from them what they think about the Rohingyas. And they very categorically said they are our people, irrespective of what, we will take them back. And there were a lot of heated discussion between them and one or two of our members you know, who were discussing. And why didn't we do it earlier? But we have to forget about what they didn't, couldn't do earlier, what they want intend to do now. And the NUG is, uh, if I quote and if I read the Burma Act and the money available with the uh, US government that is $1 billion, which seems to be ready for NUG to work. Now, this is the introduction, in introduction what I wanted to say in relation to what Pervez has said, because we are in contact, particularly uh, NSU in, uh, in contact with the NUG we are discussing. I think this is the second time that he came. Having said that, why are we discussing Myanmar now? We were not even bothered with Myanmar uh, for 30, 40 years back. I find one of our colleagues who was in Myanmar, uh, Defense Attache, and some, you were uh, the ambassadors. We never discussed Myanmar. We are discussing because we are having a problem at our end, and that is the Rohingya issue. And uh, let me be very clear, you may agree or may not agree, we have tried through diplomatic channel, uh, we failed, simply. Diplomacy is working no more. And it will, no, will, will not work anymore as long as this military junta is uh, in, 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 in power. It, it should be very clear to us and I think our old uh, friends who were in diplomatic corps, probably they would either agree with me or disagree with me, but the, this is the fact. And this is admitted now by the, by, by the foreign ministry that they could not proceed any further. And neither the Myanmar government at present government has any interest, shows any interest in, in resolving this issue. Therefore comes many other issues in such. What have we done? We have, we have approached China. I'm, I'm, I'm not repeating what Pervez has said, who all are supporting Myanmar. One of the largest investor, I believe you must yes. have said, is Singapore. One of the largest investors is Singapore, followed, followed by Japan. So let me not get into that. Let me get into a bit of a security issues. So the problem with us is the 1.1 uh, or 1.2 million Rohingyas. They are increasing by the day. They were probably 1 million. Now I believe it is 1.2. 700,000? So, so you, you have uh, the numbers. Therefore, and it's creating problem for Bangladesh. Problem in threefold. Number one is the economy. Number two, they are now getting into a conflict with the locals. Number three is the internal and external security of Bangladesh. And I see not much help which is coming from outside to resolve this crisis. We approach China. We failed. We approached India. We failed because they have the vested interest in the region. And that's particularly I'm talking about uh, Rakhine or Arakan. It's a north-south divided. And in north-south, south is with the China. North is now trying to be dominated by India. They're a bit resisted by the Arakan army, which has become a very big factor with 30,000 plus of their, their, their insurgent uh, members. Uh, and, 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 and then, of course, ULA, United, UAL, United Arakan League, who are the political face of Arakan army. Now, things become more, more complicated as Arakan army and UAL uh, is, 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 is dominating 
uh, the, 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 the area, in, in, that is the uh, Rakhine state. Arakan army has come out with a very clear uh, uh, announcement. They have said they, 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 can, they didn't say Rohingya to start with. They were very much against in one time. But now they are saying that once we achieve our aim, we will take back Arakanid Muslims and they are our people. Uh, short of telling what Rohingya is. United uh, uh, Arakan League, which is the, again I said, the face of Arakan army, they have stated the same thing, that once we achieve our aim, and their aim, they, they started with the liberation of Arakan uh, from Myanmar. As you all know, that this was uh, invaded by the uh, then Burma uh, 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 army in two, 200 years before uh, they want the Arakan to be, uh, at least if not sovereign, a self-ruled uh, uh, region. So that's what they're fighting for. So this is one uh, sec uh, segment which we have to deal with with any future if we want to discuss about the, uh, the, the repatriation of Rohingyas. It's not only Tatmado or it's not only uh, uh, the, the Myanmar armed forces or the rulers, we have to, in case, we have to discuss, we have to also take these two uh, organizations into account. Now about the China. China, as far as my uh, opinion is concerned, Myanmar is the eastern uh, sort of anchor of uh, a road and, road and belt uh, uh, project because that's the way it terminates, avoiding Malacca Strait. Therefore, uh, it is also the, the CMAC that we're talking about. You all know I'm not going to discuss this. It becomes very, very important as far as China is concerned. And India is investing money for the Kaladan project, which they have already so far in the known source, they have invested 500 uh, US dollar and which is continuing. Million. Sorry, 500 million. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my count only, $500. I can't count more than that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the situ situation is very precarious. In that comes uh, Burma Act. Uh, I think uh, I would just give you the features of the Burma Act, which does it make any hope for us? As the Pavel said, why the mention of Bangladesh and uh, Thailand? There are reasons why they have mentioned, because they think that it's with the help of Bangladesh and Thailand only, they can effectively enforce uh, Burma Act. I don't know what Mr. Donald Du came and talked, uh, that we are not very sure. Now, what is Burma Act? Burma Act is the Burma Unified Through Rigorous Military Accountability Act. So that's what is the Burma Act. Now, um, the aim, it says the Burma Act will increase US support for pro-democracy actors, increase pressure on the military government. So how they do, do it? They have uh, outlined, this is the outline I have. Uh, they, 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 they strongly support the people of Burma and return to democracy, imposes sanctions. These are very official in a sense that under the act, they impose sanctions to the various individuals and entities. That means it will have greater effect than what uh, sanctions they have imposed earlier. Authorizes funding, technical assistance, human rights and democracy related programs supports greater UN action with respect to uh, Burma. That means that they have also involved the UN and what the UN is supposed to do, that is also there. I'm just re reading the highlight out. Then we can discuss later on. The policy is very clear. They said it is the policy of United States to continue to support the people of Burma in their struggle of democracy, human rights, and justice. In this includes supporting credible process of restoration of civilian government in Myanmar or Burma, holding accountable perpetrators of human rights violation, foreign supporters, and Burmese military, providing humanitarian assistance, securing release of unlawful detained individuals. And the interesting part of this, they have talked about very severe sanctions. And sanctions, not only on people, they talked about any entity that primarily operates in the defense sector of the, Myan, uh, of the Burmese economy. I think what Pervez has outlined, and it talks about that. State-owned commercial enterprise and significantly financially benefit the military. So they are targeting those. Uh, family of members of the sanctioned officials, 
Myanmar oil and gas enterprise is very important. Uh, incidentally, Myanmar oil and gas enterprise is dominated by the Chinese investment mostly. Uh, other, in, other entities, individuals whose actions support the coup or violation of human rights. The uh, most interesting is what they, what, what it says. Uh, uh, a Burma Act authorizes but does not appropriate funds. So where from the fund comes? The, the, the money which they, has been frozen by the, by the United States of Myanmar. Now, they all talked about uh, also uh, some a portion of the fund uh, provided uh, the, the Congress supports it. Assistance of funding, who they are going to assist, that's very interesting. And it is very much concerned with Bangladesh and Bangladesh internal and external uh, security. Ethnic armed organizations, pro-democracy movement of organizations, that is NUG, that support efforts to establish an exclusive, inclusive, and representative democracy in Myanmar. It is very interesting. Now, what are these, these EAOs? They have selected three, four strongest area and strongest EAOs. One, is the Karen, which is with the Thai border, that's how Thailand comes in. Then is the is the Kayan, which is little over north of uh, almost in the Chinese border. And they have Kachin, which is in the Chinese border. And interestingly, they have Chin State, that is K3C. Chin State is with Bangladesh a little bit and, 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 and with Mizoram. And incidentally, that is India, in Mizoram. So incidentally, Chin state has 85% Christian community as Mizoram has. So uh, the other one also has a Christian community other than the, uh, other than the, uh, other than the Buddhist and uh, a bit of other ethnic group. So this is very interesting. They're very declared, very declared uh, the support for these, which is called K3C. Right. But the strongest group in Myanmar, that is Wa State Army, which is supported by Chinese. Now, the latest that I get, uh, a write-up, that China is trying to balance between the NUG and as well as Tatmado, the government. This is very latest. Uh, because they have now understood that Tatmado is facing stiff resistance not only from outside, but within uh, 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 Myanmar, particularly from these EAOs, and as well as the, the PDF, uh, People's Defense Force, which is gaining strength. Now, another interesting part is technical support and non-lethal assistance to Burmese ethnic armed organization, People's Defense Force. Now, somebody asked me in my university, what do you think of ethnical, uh, sorry, uh, non-lethal as far as the U.S. is concerned. I'm sorry, I don't know anybody sitting of U.S. Uh, embassy or origin here. I said it starts from non-lethal. It started in Ukraine non-lethal. Now they're sending weapons which can fire tactical uh, nuclear uh, uh, ammunition. So non-lethal means I'm not sending tanks, I'm not sending guns, I'm not sending air, uh, air force, but I'll give you other thing which is non-lethal, like, like like a rifle and like rocket launcher and things like that. So it's very stated uh, uh, statement that technical support uh, to non-lethal to assistance to Burmese ethnic armed organization. I don't think ethnic armed organization need bamboos to fight uh, 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 the Itatmato. <laughs> Therefore, we understand what it is. Uh, then of course, the, 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 the support talks about support of uh, technical assistance, support of civil society. It's long, I don't want to take you that much of time. And then what they do is the United Nations, they, 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 they talk that use of voice vote, influence of the United States to spar, uh, spar uh, greater action by the United Nations and United Nations Security Council pushing for, they have given a few of the clauses uh, how, where to push. Now what happened next uh, to this? Financial year 2023 appropriations must be finalized. They have, they have not probably yet finalized how much money they're going to give it. 
uh, executive branch agencies will decide how and when to spend the funding uh, they receive for the purpose of laid down in the Obama Act, what I have talked about. Then the departments of the state and treasury will work together to implement the sanctions that Burma Act requires. Department of State, including U.S. mission to U.N., will begin implementing the diplomatic directives in the Act. So that means, uh, in detail, what I think that the, the U.S. Act, which now they have they have passed by by bipartisan, I would say, yeah, it is it is very very important issue. It's no more individual sanctions. How it is going to uh, uh, relate to Bangladesh, it has already been told by General Munir. We are, we, those who independently think, because I had uh, also, like Munir, I had, uh, we had, three of us, had number of uh, contact before the, before the coup with the ex-military officers of Myanmar who had their own organization which is supported by Tatmado. Two of them now become ministers, so our our meetings have been postponed so far. But the point which I'm trying to make, therefore, what do we do? Because we are involved. We're not interested what happens inside Myanmar, whether it is taken by India or China or America. or We are interested that how do we resolve our problem? And we have not so far found any international solution to this, except in International Court of Justice, uh, some, but that, that, that hardly makes any difference. What do we do? We have tried Eastern. We have tried our uh, Western immediate neighbor. We have, we have cajoled them uh, every time. The Prime Minister has talked about in the United Nations. Nothing has moved. Therefore, what do we do? What options do we have? Do we support Burma Act? I think we have to, if we have to resolve this problem, unless Unless there is a change of heart in Myanmar, it's very difficult for Bangladesh to have a cozy relation with the neighbor, which we have neglected diplomatically for a long, long time. And we didn't even understand what they were doing in the last few years as terms of Rohingya. My last uh, conclusion, there are seven regional self-administered region in Myanmar, accepted by Tatmadu, accepted by the government. Why cannot be the eighth one? And that is Mayu Frontier State, which was there in 62, 61 to 63. And then in 64, this was dissolved. I'm sure if, if, if you want in a Q&A session, I can discuss about that. What was it? Therefore, I feel, not us, the Rohingyas and the Myanmar uh, people, People, uh, Arakan Army and others have to accept a self-administered Mayu frontier district, which is dominated by the Rohingyas, so that they can they can at least decide their daily life. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your explanation of the issues related to the Burma Act and other issues related to Myanmar. I also understand that now the U.S. Congress has appropriated $500 million for the Burma Act. So they have got funding through which they can implement. It is, a lot of the provisions have to be studied very carefully in the Burma Act because you have to read in between the lines to understand what are the actual intentions of the act. We are sitting in a very, very vulnerable and a critical space our missteps can really cost us dearly in the future. So therefore, as Bangladeshis, we need to understand all the international actors at play here. The Rohingyas are getting into a background now. It is now a power play between major powers in the world. Particularly the Sino-US relationship is coming into play here. And we need to understand that very, very carefully. Uh, before I hand over the floor to the, our next speaker, I would also like to personally differ a little from our previous speaker. I strongly believe that the only solution to the problem has to be diplomatic. There can be no military solution to the problem. And if we get into a military solution, 
it can really go against the interest of our country. And I know it is frustrating. Diplomacy is a slow process. And it is often frustrating, but that is the only path we should pursue. Our next speaker is Brigadier Shahidur Aram Khan. And sir, you have the floor for the next 10 minutes. Sure. Let me clarify. I have not talked about military solution. I said options. What do you do? And that is also diplomatic. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Huh? No, I'm, I'm explaining why that I will see. I, I chose uh, to be the last speaker and I chose to be to, to stand up and speak. Because I remember my, my headmaster telling us that, Shahid, once you are asked to speak, you stand up, speak up, and shut up. So before I shut up, I have stood up and say a few things. And why? I chose to be the last speaker and standing up speaking because at this age and this time of the day, one can't help but be overcome by a degree of torpidity. So perhaps standing will uh, keep me awake and hopefully I would finish speaking before most of you have, st have stopped listening. And I chose to be the last speaker because knowing the two erudite uh, scholars uh, uh, sitting uh, at the table, I knew that they'll uh, cover most of the issues and all that will remain for me is to ditto some of the points and make my job easier. This has been my way of life in 35 years the army. This is how I pass my time. So therefore, the last speaker. Well, two years of military rule. So, so business as usual for Myanmar. They are riding roughshod over the sentiments, international sentiments. They care to hoots about the uh, sanctions. Uh, they're going about suppressing dissent. Uh, they're faced with uh, an opposition uh, which is numerically strong, but perhaps are not as well armed as uh, the, 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 the Myanmar's army. Uh, yes, the EOA and the PDF I'm referring to. Uh, the, the Burma, uh, Myanmar has uh, no worry about uh, international opinion because the last uh, seven years, since 2017, uh, uh, the diplomatic wall against uh, uh, Myanmar was provided by our very good friends, People's Republic of China, uh, uh, India for that matter also, and to some extent Russia. Uh, all the resolutions uh, that was brought up, that were brought up uh, in international forums, including the United Nations, uh, were either uh, vetoed or these three uh, important countries abstained from, from voting. So the denouma was as expected. Nothing happened and Myanmar is going about as uh, uh, business as usual. Uh, food, uh, uh, the, the chairman spoke about food sufficiency. What is happening because of the, of the, of the uh, separative actions, military actions on these uh, states, various, the, uh, the Chin, the Chan, Kachin, and the Karan, and the uh, and, uh, uh, Karanin state, uh, uh, the, the, the lo local people have been affected. And this affected the livelihood, of the, the, the normal uh, life of the, of the common people and, 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 and uh, trade and commerce and agriculture has suffered. So Burma, Myanmar is actually suffering from food shortage. There is, there is, there is, there is, uh, there's, the food sufficiency is, I think is not, is not, not the correct assessment of the situation. Uh, but little is influenced by international opinion and more so because it is also underwritten militarily by two strong supporters, India and China. And only in 2020, India gave uh, uh, Myanmar a free submarine, free of cost, just for the taking. And China depends so heavily on Myanmar, it, uh, it cannot in any way uh, uh, look away from its interest in Myanmar and support any other cause, support any other cause. Unfortunately, it's geoeconomics that is dictating geopolitics. 
uh, which it should be. It is their in national uh, enlightened self-interest that's dictating their policies. It is, it is, it is, it cannot but be anything else. China will not pursue its foreign policy for the interest of Bangladesh. Indians will not uh, pursue their foreign policy for the interest of Bangladesh. Are we pursuing a foreign policy that serves our interest in a manner, that serves our interest? Several months ago, I wrote an article in the Daily Star. What have we done with our uh, strategic assets? We have strategic assets. Have we utilized them? We have abstained from voting on the Ukrainian issue. On the Ukrainian uh, issue, in the, we have stopped voting. Did you seek anything as quid pro quo? What I'm saying is, when you say diplomacy failed, have you utilized di diplomacy in the manner that we should have? Diplomacy, there are three major options open to us. Diplomacy, diplomacy, and diplomacy. But then, recall 1978. Recall 1978. 300,000 Rohingyas were repatriated in the matter of 14 days because Bangladesh had the military clout to say thus far and no further. If you don't take them back, there'll be a consequences. Can we say that today? We can't say that today. I recall in 1970, 1980, I was, I was doing a staff called at Camberley and there was this, 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 this uh, ossified Burmese colonel who was like my great grandfather. And I said, Colonel, what is your size of your army? Uh, Colonel, yes, you have uh, two and a half battalions here and uh, 30 uh, uh, APCs and 12 guns. What is the state of the military? I'm not talking about militarization of Bangladesh or, you know, uh, I'm, what I'm talking about is recording enough clout. Diplomacy must be supported by something. And you don't have to uh, exp explore what? It has to be diplomacy. Diplomacy, yes. But diplomacy has to be supported militarily. So when you say, I'm sure, General, General, uh, uh, you, do not, you do not mean military action or military options. You said the, 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 the military option, not military action. Military options is the fourth option. But even that is also remote. There's not, but your, your, your diplomatic option must be supported. All the, all the four neighboring, major neighboring countries of Myanmar have been affected by the Myanmar's actions in the borders. They have been thoroughly, for China, the, the major uh, sort of the, 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 the economic corridor. The work on the economic corridor has been, has been, uh, has been disrupted. So, so uh, Indian, Indian corridor that links, uh, uh, because th th those are areas of major insurgency. They are not willing to weigh. We have to, we have to accept, we have to realize. The day before yesterday, I was listening to a deliberation uh, in BISS on exactly the same issue, on, on, on the Rohingyas. And I was very, I was very sort, of, sort of surprised, or well, not so surprised, but uh, sort of, by the, by the, by the sort of the, the, the puerile, hopeful, rhapsodic thoughts of global action of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, regional uh, players action. Global action has failed. ASEAN has failed. You know, in the sense that ASEAN is not willing to go anything beyond than the kid, kid, kid glove uh, attitude that they're showing towards, towards, towards Myanmar. China, Russia, and India are not willing Quote, quote unquote, take action that will precipitate the situation and will 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 make the military junta more 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 uh, tensile. So therefore, we have to realize one thing: Burma wills more diplomat, more strategic uh, ways than Bangladesh. The benefits accruing to these countries in siding more with Myanmar is more than does their supporting us on issues uh, related, related to the Rohingyas. It is, it, is, it is the reality. You cannot help it. 
we, we do not have that weightage. So therefore, what we have to do? The international committee has not been successful. Even the UN forum has, 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 has not been able to deliver. We are thankful to the Western uh, uh, countries for the support economically. But as far as diplomatic support is concerned, or effort, there's no lack of effort, uh, implications. Uh, one third of the forest land has been depleted. You know, it's creating, a, it's creating an internal flux locally. The job market has been taken over by the Rohingyas. So how long can we play host? Understand the reality. Don't look up to your, to your friends and to your development partners or to international organizations support. Develop your own trout where you can call the shots and then seek a solution to this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brigadanam. And just to add to the point that our last speaker had made, any credible foreign policy has to be backed by credible deterrence. And credible deterrence is where we are lacking now. If we have to have credible deterrence to back our foreign policy, then we have to have a degree of military superiority, both in numbers and quality. And there has to be an internal political element where the dysfunctional politics of Bangladesh is not helping anyway. We need to have a coherent political stand as a nation, backed by credible deterrence. Only then our foreign policy can work. I would also like to mention that to start with, we were taken by surprise when the Rohingyas came. That is a failure. The Rohingyas just did not drop from the sky. It was simmering inside. We failed to take the symptoms into notice. So when they came, we are completely surprised. At one time, we did not have a coherent policy because we opened the door. We asked them to come. Once they came, they never went back. So we have to go back also to be critical of our own policies and see where we failed and what we need to do now. We cannot put the blame on somebody else's shoulder. As our last speaker did mention that we have to leverage the key strategic points that we have internally as a country. We have not been able to leverage our strategic assets. So we are not of much value to our international friends who are pursuing their own national interest. And in real politic, there is no emotion. It's only interest and it's only national interest that works. So we will now open the floor. Please, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to ask our speakers. And let me see uh, some indications and show of hand, and I'll probably have to stand. Okay, let me, okay, thank you. Well, we will first start with Dr. Iftikhar, and those of you who don't know him, he's our former foreign policy advisor or the foreign Minister during the caretaker period. Dr. Iftakari of the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, General. Uh, okay, I initially wanted to, when I came into the room, speak to uh, the principle of the responsibility to protect what I thought would have been very relevant to, uh, to Myanmar, Burma. But now having heard the three very distinguished speakers, uh, could I take a few moments to react to, to some of those uh, uh, remarks that they've made? Pervez made the made a mention and, and very, uh, 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 th this is sometimes beyond the public eye, the, the nuclear options that Burma at one point in time, time was thinking of pursuing. The received wisdom is that they do not at this point in time have the cap capability. However, however, considerable work in that regard has been done by someone called Dr. Desmond Ball. Professor Desmond Ball uh, wrote a book uh, or, or uh, eventually a, a long article which followed years of research on how the Tatmadaw talks. And he spoke of the potentials that Burma has of 
producing nuclear weapon. Now, that is to be matched by the delivery capability that they have acquired from North Korea. So you see, you match the potentials of North Korea, and it's a very dangerous uh, cold, cold, cold run. Then, uh, um, and Dr. Sakhawat spoke of, uh, of uh, options. Now here I bring in the R2P, responsibility to protect, the principle that was determined in 2005 as a part of the outcome document of the world leaders. There are three articles to it, Article 138, I think, and Article 139, where the philosophical underpinning was as follows. It is the responsibility of every government to protect its own population. Should the government be uh, uh, unwilling or unable to uh, afford that uh, protection, this responsibility devolves on the international community, which operating through the United Nations Security Council will implement that uh, responsibility. In other words, responsibility of protection is not of governments alone, but also global community. That is the other philosophical uh, uh, underpinning of this. Now, however, the four caveats entered here, and the caveats are, okay, one is genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity, that these elements would have to exist if the R2P is to be implemented. Remember but that R2P does not really mean military action only because it can begin upstream uh, in, in terms of humanitarian intervention uh, as well. Now, very carefully calibrated fashion, over the last few years, the United Nations officials, beginning with Prince Zahad bin Arad, uh, who was uh, uh, High Commissioner of, of hum Human Rights, the Jordanian uh, 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 former minister, uh, he called Burma a textbook, Burmese uh, uh, junta's actions a textbook of ethnic cleansing. Remember, he's using one of the caveats. Then a United Nations uh, commission used the other three expressions crimes against humanity, genocide, etc., and indicted six junta leaders, including uh, uh, Binong Line, uh, Line, for possible prosecution, etc. So all these caveats were mentioned, and the grounds were prepared for a possible R2P by officials of the United Nations, but officials do not take decisions, member states do. Here the problem was, you see, the uh, R2P is something after Libya became very controversial. Controversial because uh, uh, it, because it was it is apparent that it can't be used ever against any of the P5 countries for obvious reasons. And in case of Burma also, uh, China and Russia would veto it. Even for America, uh, genocide, acceptance of genocide would be a problem. Not that... American policymakers do not believe that genocide uh, has been perpetrated in, uh, in Burma. They probably do. But the problem is it would uh, compel them under American law to take some action for which they're not yet prepared. However, so those options are ruled out. Now we come to the, uh, the sanctions bit. Yes, what the talk, ongoing talks now, is the possibility of extremely targeted sanctions on officials and their dependents relating to their bank accounts and other privileges personal. Secondly, secondly, issuance of arrest warrants for those who are pot potentially convictable, if there is such a word. And, and there have been precedents in case of General Pinochet in, 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 in Chile, who, who, who was incarcerated in London, as you know, for, for two years. So that is number three, or two. Number three, these tribe ICJ and all that are time consuming, long, legal, unimplementable uh, uh, exercises. Number three, special tribunals, as was done in the case of Rwanda. So these are being contemplated now. Now, married to this Burma Act that you spoke of, if you look at the language of the Burma Act, it again is in many cases a replication of some of these expressions that, were, that have come in R2P. So, so 
there is a possibility uh, uh, if there is a consensus among the bigger players of the United Nations, forget the United Nations as, uh, 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 in, in the framework that we know it as, but the main actors of the United Nations, something can be done and something should be done. Uh, Anam, you mentioned uh, 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 the old, uh, what did you say about the old generals that, uh, that is business as, as usual for them. And that is indeed so, because as a very young CSP officer, I remember I went to Burma in 1972 in order to try and uh, negotiate the return of the aircraft that was flown and helicopters that were flown by uh, Pakistan. And there was Colonel Ula Khan, who was the foreign minister, and Colonel Ula Khan, who was the deputy minister. Those colonels and that ilk have become generals now, but everything remains the same. So. The, the bottom line is the international community will need to take certain actions that will compel the junta to understand that the uh, curve of, of a global uh, moral uh, uh, responsibility or justice is long, but it is bent towards justice. And the sooner they understand this, it's better for them and is better for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for your intervention. Mariam, you have the floor. I'll get you the microphone. Yes, microphone, please. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Please. I, just, I just had a very basic question. Uh, you mentioned the Burma Act and the U.S. Congress passed that. So I was just wondering, uh, and I assume they did not, but did they consult Bangladesh, considering Bangladesh and Thailand have been mentioned in it? Did they consult? Did they okay. consult Bangladesh before implementing? Yeah, the we'll, act we'll come back to the, it? to the answer. Thank you. All right. My answer was, did they consult Bangladesh on anything? Okay, all right. Uh, okay. We'll have Jill Shahid. And Shahid has been a, a military attache in Yangon, so he should be able to throw some light. Please be brief. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, first of all, sir, uh, Barma Act. Uh, I, I'll say that we should see through the, not in isolation, the Burma Act, that is for Myanmar. It's actually in 2022 or 2023, it is enacted by seeing the containment of China policy. That's the extension of it, behind it. Because there's a many thing in this aspect here, because you must remember, sir, there was another uh, 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 similar act previous in the regime. This, whatever in this one, it's most of them are similar thing. You see, most of the uh, newspapers which you see, just Irrawaddy Times, DVB from the Myanmar, those are the product of that an act uh, which was enacted previously. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is that this isolation, number one, number two is that uh, um, is, uh, you have to see through the eyes of uh, US containment policy of China. This is number one. Number two is that, sir, uh, sir some of the observations, it's my pure personally personal um, uh, touch right sir with i if i may uh, take clue from dr iftikhar about the nuclear uh, um, issue sir i took my two chiefs to that same place where world has been saying that this is a there's a nuclear facilities there and i went to that building i took my chief also to that building and we are the only one who were given access to that in 2012. so they are actually yes they have got one thing which we don't know is that they have created a base of 4,000 scientists trained in Russia, paid in cash. That's the biggest thing they have got. Otherwise, uh, infrastructurally, there is nothing, sir, so far. So with this one, number two is that, sir, NUG, uh, PDF, and EAO, sir. We must remember all these three entities are different. None of them having coordination with each other. Whatever EAO is saying, they are not fighting their battle, energy's battle, or neither PDF is fighting energy's battle. Energy is different, PDF is different, and EOS are different. And all you remember uh, here, none of the EOS, they believe energies because energy is the extension of Aung San Suu Kyi. So they are the same people who were there in 2017, as Sarah mentioned, that they were there, they didn't do anything at that time, the same people. And Next is that uh, in Burma, there's one thing it was mentioned that uh, within 180 days, they're supposed to uh, name a coordinating 
headquarter plus some coordinator, which hasn't been uh, yet uh, enacted, rather mentioned, rather announced by the White House yet. So uh, this is a uh, one thing we have to mention that uh, the $500 million, it is from 2023 to 27. So uh, I don't know how far it will go, um, this, uh, um, the $500 million which has been uh, given so far. Uh, now, uh, my conclusion is that sir, Burma Act has got both positive and, of course, uh, we have, should be concerned one. Positive that, that this is the first time I've seen any got, got documentation from the U.S. mentioning about Rohingya. Rohingya plus 2017 genocide. This is mentioned specifically, explicitly in this document. This is a positive thing which we should be taking we should be taking advantage of that one. Number two is that in, act, in this act, there is another very drawback, is that in this act, uh, rather the, uh, so far, the, whatever the uh, Rohingya has been getting, there is a drastic change in some of the policies, like education of Rohingyas. The, in this in act, this is missing. Funding has been reduced. Yes, funding and but plus education specifically, sir, this is missing. In, the, in conclusion, sir, that's a you are not going to see, rather, we are not going to see any drastic change in U.S. policy through this Burma Act. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shad. Group Captain Zayed, at the rear. Please be brief in your questions so we can take as many the, questions uh, as possible. Uh, the topic is very close to me uh, uh, and also uh, very glad to hear Excellence Ambassador talking about the global responsibility to protect uh, the responsibility to protect. Uh, actually, one of my article was published in a journal called Global Responsibility to Protect from Australia. On Brill, I'm working a sequel on that. And in that article, which was published in 2019, I did talk about uh, formulating a international uh, ICTR, International Court, uh, Crime, uh, Court of Tribunal for Rohingyas, uh, drawing reference from the other three uh, the Bosnia, Cambodia, Sierra Leone, and Rwanda. So uh, coming to the uh, actually substantial, uh, substantive part of today's presentation, I think uh, much is already known and deliberated. But what probably needs to be probing into and uh, looked into more uh, with some bit of nuances is that, uh, do you think, I mean, is, does any of the panelists think uh, that the failure of the major regional power and those who are also the neighbor of uh, Myanmar, like India and China, can, uh, uh, does it give more legitimacy to bring about a change in the Rohingya issue? Does it gives more legitimacy of an extra regional power to come in to this uh, event and change the status quo, even if it entails invoking R2P through the UNSC? And if that is so, what would be the incentive or disincentive for Bangladesh to be on board on that kind of a path, which is uh, spearheaded by an extra regional power? Probably that is a very profound question that we need to sort of probe into to set the direction of what can be done. Thank you. Thank you. But realistically speaking, with the current structure of the Security Council, with the status of the P5, the prospect of getting an R2P resolution through the Security Council is almost zero, or completely zero. So we have to be practical in seeing what can be the pathways for R2P. Admiral Owl, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I was reading an uh, assessment by CSIS on the Burma Act. What they have assessed is that uh, it is a modified, you know, the House of Representatives, uh, they have passed it in April. That was much more robust. And it was, uh, when it passed by the Senate, it is watered down. So what they say that, yes, uh, it is a new direction. Uh, it has the potential uh, for uh, the, as the Congress dictates the government to become Myanmar as a US, uh, you know, security priority uh, if the government wants. 
and then uh, what it was uh, done about the sanction. It has gone for very uh, steep targeted sanction on a uh, person, their dependents and all. But what is it has avoided is the sanction on the Myanmar oil and gas company and the enterprises. It has left to the president on discretion. There lies the thing. Because if there is sanction on those entities, Myanmar will be gone. But there it cannot do because US and the uh, European companies are still there in Myanmar in the uh, oil and gas. That cannot be there. And explicitly what has been left out is imports from Myanmar has been kept outside the Obama Act. That means import will be on. So that's, uh, that's there. So their assessment is that, yes, it is a significant step, but it depends on the White House. If they want to do it, there can be significant progress. Now I come to the next point on uh, what is next. There is a uh, question now coming, the Indonesia is taking over the presidency. And uh, President uh, uh, Vidado, he has uh, uh, given a proposal, and the foreign minister also spoken uh, in the last Davos uh, uh, World Economic Forum uh, session. So there the proposal is that uh, somebody more competent should replace the commander in chief. And chair now, he wants to send a general to Myanmar to talk with the general so that they can replicate uh, the Indonesian uh, in a model for a Myanmar for democratization. There comes the offram for uh, a Myanmar. Whatever you call the Burma Act and whatever the case, is that what happens to Myanmar? If the, there are two options. If the NUZ uh, wins, then uh, what happens? NUZ is the same Aung San Suu Kyi people. And uh, they are the bummer. And there are seven uh, independent EOs and 135 uh, ethnic groups, it will be total chaos and collapse of Myanmar. This is uh, one option. Another is the, uh, you know, the junta, it prevails. And eventually also uh, there is possibility that Myanmar could collapse. For the US, for the international community, whatever we say, if the thing is the whether the Myanmar uh, stand erect or not. Uh, take the case of Syria, same authorization act was in Syria. When the question came, if the Assad goes, what happens? There will be chaos. So uh, America spared Assad, and he went on. So my question is, if the situation comes where the you know Indonesia is the chair for uh, uh, ASEAN, and that's the best hope we have because others uh, will not do anything. So they are trying to do something. So this is indicating an offram for Myanmar. Again, a sort of status quo ante of 2010 election and all this, which uh, you know, President Obama came and twice he visited Myanmar and he did the transition. Is the same situation coming in some form if it becomes apparent to the USA that the junta can give the guarantee of uh, you know intact Myanmar? I think uh, it may go for that. Otherwise, if they can uh, want to. Uh, support the NUJ. Then comes the question of support through whom? These materials and other things has to go through. It, is, it cannot uh, go for airdrop. There comes the Myanmar and Bangladesh, uh, the Thailand and Myanmar. And India has not been uh, mentioned. And most importantly, the, uh, the biggest uh, uh, players, the India, uh, Japan, and uh, South Korea, they have not been mentioned. So in that case, what will be the, our position? if the Burma acts come into play. And uh, you understand that when US goes with its outfit to support uh, the NUZ with its non-lethal and technical support, it has to go through uh, Bangladesh and Thailand. India has not been mentioned. Maybe you know India won't do anything. So what will be Bangladesh's position in that case? Because in our case, in any position, in any option, collapse of Myanmar will be disastrous for Bangladesh. That's a disaster for the region, for us also. And the Obama Act, if it comes to play, uh, my hunch is it will be again in Syria. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Not, not a good prospect to listen to. <laughs> but the fact remains that more than the Thailand angle, the Bangladesh angle is more and more important because of Rakhine. 
the reason I'm saying this is the presence of the Chinese in Rakhine State, and in particular, the presence of the Chinese in Chukpu Port. If you just recollect the map of Rakhine, Chukpu is a deep sea port that has been constructed by the Chinese with 80% ownership for next 99 years lease. It is a major energy hub through which they can bypass the Malabar states, Malacca states. So it gives them a vital energy security and energy independence. And that is something that the Chinese value at most. It is also the place where the CIMAC also touches, which is part of the BRI corridors. Of the six BRI corridors, two are maritime corridors. And CIMAC is one of those two. It's the China-Myanmar economic corridor that ends up in the Bay of Bengal. It is a critical entry to the Indian Ocean. Whatever is happening in Rakhine is again linked back to the maritime strategy and also linked back to the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States and the West. So the game is far, far bigger than the Rohingyas now. It is time for Bangladeshis to understand that we have unwittingly entered into a big power play. And unless we can play our cards right, it can be disastrous for a small country like Bangladesh. Ambassador Islam, please, sir, you have the floor. Microphone. Yeah, here. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, General Muri Zaman. Thank you, the three distinguished speakers. You have brought us up to date uh, about what has been happening in Myanmar for the last two years since it has been under military rule. And the uh, submissions, the presentations were excellent. It has left us uh, with a lot of knowledge about what is happening there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the deductions that the take home things that you are taking away is that in Myanmar, the military has come to stay. They've come and they're getting stronger. And whatever is happening outside, whether you talk about the Obama Act, or you talk about what is happening, or the reactions of ASEAN, or the reactions of any other country, the Myanmar, the, as my good friend Shadaranam has said, you know, the, the Myanmar military is now cozily entrenched, and they are doing mainly, they are going about their game or doing whatever they are doing, and they don't deem, it doesn't seem like they will be dislodged anytime soon. And in this context, I'd, be, I'd like to say, because we are, you know, at the, uh, in a, we are going to really receive whatever comes out of Myanmar. One of the you know, uh, aspects that came out is from, from my good friend, Dr. Iftakar, he said about the military, nuclear options that Myanmar is working upon. We are sitting here, we have missed the bus. If you're talking about what is happening about this reaction, I don't know. I'm not an expert on Myanmar. I try to follow Bangladesh's relations with India, in South Asia, and with other countries, but Myanmar has never looked at Myanmar very deeply. But being a, a member of the Republic Pope and having known what happened between Myanmar and Bangladesh during my years in the Foreign Ministry, I'd like that's why when Dr. Begir Shakawat was making his presentation and was rolling out the diplomatic option, I was really shaking my head very hard. Because diplomatic option, however weak, and it is for us, because as we said, if we have missed years in the concept, the diplomatic option is the only option. But it has become incredibly weak. It's so weak that I cannot even say how weak it is. But that is again the only option. The reason I say it so is in the past, twice, it is the third time, the Rohingyas who came to Bangladesh in 2017 and was the highest number. Previously, twice, the Rohingyas were pushed by incredible, unbelievable, unbelievable in, in humanity by the Myanmar's army. They just drove the daylight, daylight out of the Myanmar in Rohingyas and drove them into Bangladesh <clears throat> to save their lives because it was, it was in fact, the High Commissioner for Refugees said it is an act of genocide. That act of genocide drove at that time, as my good friend Brigitte Shahid uh, said, 700,000, that was five years ago. The Rohingya women in the meantime in the camps have given birth to another few hundred thousand children. They're all Rohingyas. 
So we are in our hands have more than a million refugees and we do not know how to take care of them. And in 19, uh, 2018 or 17, when we reached this agreement, or the point I was making before, twice before, in 1978 and 1992, twice we diplomatically, through the negotiation uh, table, we did succeed in sending back each and every one of those refugees who came in 2000 and 1978 uh, and 1991. Together, there were half a million. We were able to send them back. But this time, it is diplomacy, which is the, our only way out, is what failed us. If you go back to 2017, I forget the date, when we signed the agreement with the Myanmar government, I think it was 2017, November, if I'm not mistaken. The agreement was thrust down upon us by our two good, good friends and two of the key players in whose table lies squarely it's not with the Americans. It's squarely in the hand of the Chinese, squarely in the hand of the Indians, and to some extent on the ASEAN and perhaps Singapore, because it's so deeply entrenched in Myanmar. In their hands, Americans, they are doing, I don't know what they are doing, it's their business, but they're not going to solve the problem of the Rohingya refugees for us. It is the Indians and the Chinese in 2017, November, the document they asked us to sign, in fact, encouraged and I would say, quote unquote, undiplomatically, almost forced us to sign, is an agreement at that time when I looked at the agreement, without any expert knowledge on the subject, I said to my friends, not one refugee will go back under that. The reason is, in that agreement, the Rohingyas were not even named, were not even named. They, they even refused to name. Kofi Annan was the person buying that agreement. You know, he will get the United Nations back into that agreement. He also ignored the fact that the one million refugees, the largest number of refugees in recent times, have not even named in this document by name. So you see the amount of hypocrisy that's going on there. The, the lesson that will come out from here today is, if my good friend Iftikhar is said the apprehensions to which he has alluded, the Myanmaris have the capacity as the North Koreans. If they want to get the nuclear weapon, they will get it. If they get it, for good or bad, the country that will be the recipient of that will be Bangladesh. And, and, then the, and then the military option, the military option, the military option, the point that Dr. Estegar made to me, military option is not for us, not for the Bangladesh military, the zero. Don't even discuss it, put it under the table or put it under the carpet, forget it. Because the military option, as far as Bangladesh military is concerned, vis-a-vis -vis the Myanmar military, does not exist. But the point is very strong. Diplomatically, can we, but diplomatic option, there is there, whether it's there or not, I don't know. But if we can motivate the powers that be, but there is a monster coming up. There's a demon coming up like the North Koreans. They have not yet got the nuclear weapon. Can you still hold them by the neck, pull them down? There the military option comes. Can you motivate the powers that be to threaten the mind? It's not a sanction. Sanctions, sanctions will not work. So if the sanctions do not work, can we diplomatically motivate the, not with the Burma Act, can the mind be threatened we, for, we, we miss the bus with the North Koreans. We should not miss the bus with the Myanmaris. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aisha Kabir from Protomalo. Um, i just like to raise a point which I don't think has been discussed, but I think it's a very urgent point, is that uh, in recent times, uh, WFP, the World Food Program, has announced that it is drastically cutting down aid, food aid, and also refugees. So that would mean the Rohingya refugees too. So right now, at least we're getting international aid, the food aid, financial aid for the refugees. But with that drastic cut from WFP, what is going to happen? And um, as it is, uh, international assistance and attention is turning towards, there's the Ukraine war, there's the 
earthquake in Turkey. So attention is turning away or has already turned away from the Rohingyas, has dwindled from the Rohingya problem. And with this cut in funds from the United Nations um, WFP, what is going to happen? I mean, how are we going to feed these people? Isn't that going to you know, lead to a very explosive situation, like a pressure cooker in the Rohingya camps? Thank you, Aisha. The, the last question will be from one of our guest students. And you have 30 seconds. Be very brief. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir, for giving me the floor. Sir, my question is that Myanmar, China, Myanmar, Singapore, and those countries are having a good term friendship, uh, as per I know from uh, Pavis, sir. So my question is like that, from the perspective of Bangladesh, we are giving them the facilities, we are giving them the food, so they are increasing their, increasing their number day by day. So from the uh, theory of realism or liberalism, we are not matching those of uh, reality or those of theories because we are not getting any type of uh, benefits from them. So my question is that diplomacy is good and it is a slow process that we know, but we are already having much more time with them. Already five years have passed uh, from uh, since uh, 2017 to 2022. Uh, uh, three, the millions of people are living here. So it is harming our internal security, internal sovereignty, internal everything that shouldn't be. So my question is that how far we have gone? What is the progress of it that we are working for our own country? Because our country is day by day, we are harming by them. Uh, they are just uh, increasing their number. We are losing our internal private uh, security. Uh, others country can harm us. Uh, even the Rohingya uh, member are not educated enough, educated enough. So this can be harmful for us. So my question is that simply, how far we have gone in the positive way that can be uh, good for us in the upcoming days? Thank you, sir. Thank you. We will now go back to our panel. And each of the speakers will have two minutes to respond. So, Parvez, you have next two minutes. Do I answer from here or do I... Uh, it has fallen short by $350 million. Whereas the United States of America has, and again, every country is free to pursue its security objectives. First of all, it dedicates 5% of its annual defense budget to the Russia-Ukraine war. So again, let's, and again, geostrategic realities keep on evolving. The Rohingya crisis is not on the top list. The only country which is afflicted with the Rohingya crisis is us, Bangladesh. That's about it. Let us first of all acknowledge this. Now, one thing that we could try, and I, I, I do not know why people do not even think about this, probably because they're very, uh, again, the ingenious uh, bent of mind. One is that we could always use the Rohingyas, those who are able to work above 18 years old, in building or in, in coming up with Rohingya handicrafts and then asking for duty-free, quota-free exports with the idea that, again, these are forcibly displaced Rohingya nationals from Myanmar and export them to European Union and America. Because the idea is that, again, if you are talking about human rights, if you're talking about the right to protect, surely you can also basically allow export under, again, local Bangladeshi supervision, which by which will alleviate the need for, uh, the need for aid trade will replace aid and also a certain portion of the locals will be involved in this work and it can be done under army supervision. But then again, reality hits us is that the world is going through a global financial crisis. So I do not know how much of a stomach for this will be there. 
number one. And just one point again, regarding the Burma Act, reminds me of a saying from the, which is inspired from the Trojan War. Beware of the Greeks bearing gifts, because Thailand itself has, again, a lot of restive provinces bordering Malaysia. We have our own limited, uh, what would I say, regional uh, or again, sub-regional, sub-ethnic problems in Chittagong Hill Tracts. Again, Bangladesh is way better. Let us not use or let us not allow any power, whether regional, extra-regional, to use the Burma Act to create instability because we are sitting on an arc of crisis. Like Brzezinski has said it about, uh, about Central Asia, but from Northeast Asia all the way to the ASEAN countries, each of us are living in our own glass house. We dare not throw stones. And right now, even if you want to talk about, again, matching up with Myanmar's military, Reality should strike you that we have taken a loan from $4.7 billion from IMF. The Adani project deal is up in smoke, where we cannot extricate ourselves. We do not know what will happen to the Rosatom nuclear power plant, which is necessary for us because of our power generation. Last but not the least, Ramzan hasn't hit us with our inflationary surges. And IMF's advice of floating the exchange rate when that will hit, we don't know how low the value of Taka will sink against the dollar. And the first condition for military might and preparedness is resources. I'm not trying to scare anyone, but we, I'm just trying to say this is a volatile powder keg. We need to approach this with extreme caution. I'm not saying cowardice. I'm not saying that, again, we will let the Myanmaris do whatever they want to. But we also need to know that we are quite alone in this venture. And every country will try to pursue its own national objectives, which may not be in concord with ours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think uh, there was very specific questions except that, uh, Ambassador Islam. I, didn't, I really didn't suggest that we should go haywire with the military. I know exactly where we, sta where, where we stand. But what I said that we have very limited options. A window is very closing, I would say almost. What do we do? I said, what do we do? We tried Eastern approach. We tried uh, Northwestern approach. Uh, I mean, next door neighbor. So what options do we have uh, left with? Last, I would just say, uh, we don't know, madam, uh, what happened at the question you asked. Uh, as you said, does U.S. ever ask anybody when they went into Libya or Iraq or Syria or what they're doing in Ukraine? So we really don't know. And do we have to tell them, yes, come or you don't come? We, we, we are already being twisted, uh, if I may say so. Uh, I have not seen in the last probably 20 years so many uh, uh, people from high up or middle up coming to Bangladesh and talking about everything from 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 ballot to bullet. So we really don't know uh, how much taken. But I can tell you one thing. Think it off. Think it off. I have served in a hill track like him, uh, commanded a, a commanded a brigade in the south, where now you are you are you, you are hearing uh, Sharkia, yeah. and then plus KK, KNF, Kuki National Front, and then you are talking about connecting it with CNA, that is Chin National Army. Think of it. I mean, those who are keeping track, they know very well. I can vouch that there was hardly any Kuki uh, uh, family in the place which is known as Ruma or Thanchi. Tanchi. I served there for about three years. And uh, I think I, I, I would know those places, if not like my palm of my hand, at least the, 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 the lines of my hand. Where from these cookies have come? There's uh, one gentleman whose name is here. He, is, he belongs to a bomb community. He's not a cookie. They are converted into Christianity. Not much of Tanchangas also there. 
so these are the these are the small element now they are becoming big and the gentleman who is heading knf he is not in 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 hill track he is in chin that's what i could understand i would know uh, that little bit so how chin army which is not part of uh, bangladesh hill track is connected with it and then very interestingly very interestingly is the call we call fundamentalist islamists they are connected with this people because they are not they are not islamists the christians so what impression they give they said okay they are ahle kitab so we can always take help this is a dangerous sort of development if not a big way but it shows that what is coming in on unto us so therefore we have to be very very careful what do we do and uh, i didn't say the diplomacy it's end of diplomacy what i said the diplomacy did not work so far how it worked i don't know but diplomacy alone doesn't work in such cases it has to be supported by the force and i i, I know ambassador islam and uh, good old our senior uh, chaudhry would know that what i mean by diplomacy and supported by force which are we are seeing all over the world thank you very much i don't have much to say <clears throat> thank you very much i think uh, group captain zaid's uh, question uh, made us an answer uh, and I'll, i'll answer attempt to answer that but first just let me reiterate the fact that uh, our our r2p is a non starter as long as there's a veto is a non starter unless unless uh the stakeholders are compelled in the way that the us was in bypassing uh the united nations uh before attacking iraq so i think that's that that is that is there is there is a sort of a sort of a there's a caveat there at this moment and uh, one thing that we didn't mention uh that uh, the 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 army in uh, myanmar are trying to hold an election this year so let us see what happens how they're going to bring in the um, what what transpire what 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 turns out uh sanctions never work as of now millions of tons of burma tea is exported to america which is put certain percentages of uh, in myanmar under sanction millions and tons of burma tea and the last 30 years uh, before the uh, election in 2010 there number of american companies operating in 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 circumventing the uh, sanctions and operating in 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 Myanmar now the question i think is a very good question that 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 demands uh, um, uh, our 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 time and, and failure of the major regional powers invite supra regional powers to intervene <clears throat> motivations have to be there i mean who is capable of intervening extra regional who is capable of intervening and whoever is capable of intervening uh, is 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 uh, myanmar a priority area if that coincide then perhaps and i'm thinking is very far fetched is very far fetched and weird for us outlandish there's one country is capable of intervening far from its shore but does uh the benefit of intervening uh what will be the benefit of intervening and 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 what will accrue from uh intervening in myanmar does myanmar uh, sort of uh, uh merit being put in the high security priority list of that country i'm not mentioning any country i'm saying the country so perhaps i'm not trying to skirt your question or i'm trying to sort of uh answer uh, your question through the question that you put Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will not attempt to summarize anything that has been said in this very rich discussion. The only question that I would like to lay before you before we end is that the problem is now way beyond the Rohingyas. It's much bigger than the Rohingya crisis and the complexities are far far greater than what we had inherited in the beginning. And that is a world that we have to live in. so it is important for our policy makers to take note and chart the course accordingly please join me in thanking our panelists this afternoon
It's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you all for attending the session this afternoon and please join us for a cup of tea. Thank you.